Hi everyone, you've joined us today for a haiku tutorial. My name's Kathy Basil, and I'd like to introduce you to haiku, a type of short, almost addictive form of poetry that's very suitable for this challenging time we're experiencing. In October of 2018, I began an exchange of haikus with another retired English teacher in Ottawa. We'd snap a picture of some glimpse of nature, write a haiku to accompany it, and text them across the country to the other. It was a really fun pastime that we continued into the pandemic. We called it a haiku volley. This slideshow aims to teach you the history and structure of the haiku with the hope that you'll give it a go as well. Haiku has been around for a really long time. It originated in Japan in the 17th century. Basho, a Japanese poet who lived in the 1600s, holds the title of the father of the haiku. In the 1900s, the West became interested in all aspects of Japanese art. Early 20th century poets like Amy Lowell, D.H. Lawrence, Carl Sandburg, they were all influenced by the haiku. Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac, two of the most famous 1960s beat poets, began to write haikus. Now the Western literary world restructured the more traditional form. The traditional structure of a Japanese haiku is three lines of 17 syllables. Each line has a required number of syllables. The first line is supposed to have five, the second line should have seven, and the third line finishes with the remaining five. This sign pokes fun at haikus. They are so concise that they will sometimes earn criticism from an impatient reader. They don't make sense, they'd say. The challenge for the writer, though, is to make quite a lot of sense in quite a few syllables. Haikus are all about the moment, so it has to be written in the present tense. The content must link the reader and the message to the natural world. Connected to that is the necessity for the language to be concrete. There should not be any abstract words like emotions. For example, we shouldn't use words like love, honesty, or loyalty. Instead, we would want to have created an understanding of those emotions by appealing to the reader's five senses sight, smell, touch, sound, and taste. Most of us would agree that the easiest of these five for, for writers is sight. A haiku uses though at least one of the other four senses alongside sight, and this allows the reader to feel as though they have been immersed into the image of the poem. Let's take a look at one of Basho's as an example. His haikus, of course, were written in Japanese, and so they were in 17 syllables of the Japanese language. Now, sometimes when they're translated to English, it's not a complete translation to 17 syllables. As it turns out, this one does work that way, but we'll see that a student of, of um, Basho's will look at one of his poems, Busan's, in the next slide, and that won't be an even 17 in the translation. So this one does, though, work out to be a 575 breakdown. There's definitely a connection to nature. We've got frogs and ponds and, and the silence of the world around them. And we have, just in that reference to the silence, we have uh, the, the extra sense of sound accompanying a lot of sight. So all of those uh, requirements have been met. It's in the present tense, the natural world's there, concrete imagery being used, and we have two senses being used. Another more advanced technique um, that is used in traditional Japanese haiku is the use of a cutting word. There is a huge list in Japanese language of these cutting words, but we don't have that in English. So what we do is sometimes we replace the use of a cutting word with a colon or some other, a dash perhaps, piece of punctuation. In this poem, we see the word splash being used as the cutting word. It's, it allows a juxtaposition of two images to occur. Before it, we have silence, then we have noise in the splash, and then we have silence again. So that it breaks the poem into two different parts. 
sound and silence being contrasted. Okay, let's take a look at another Japanese translation uh, by a student of Basho, Basan. Um, here we can see two images sparking off or juxtaposing one another. The light of a candle transfers to another, spring twilight. If we look carefully at what's actually happening on the, in the lines of the poem, we have the visual of a single candle lighting another single candle. Then there is a dash, which is working as the cutting word substitute. And this is followed with the contrast to an immense night sky filled with winking stars. So we go back to what the requirements are to make a really good haiku. And we, we look through our list. We've got present tense, check. Natural world, check. Concrete imagery, check. Let's look at the actual appeal to senses. Definitely the sight. The others are much more subtle, but they're present. We have sound, we have touch, and we have smell, really. They're very subtle. In the word spring, even spring twilight, that phrase, We've got night sounds being suggested, a coolness of the air. We have, within the candle imagery, we have wax, the smell of wax, the smell of sulfur as it's lit, you know, that the, the wick is lit. And so you could argue that there are a number of other senses that help us feel as though we are right in that moment. Let's leave ancient Japan now and go closer to home. Canada has its own haiku master in Erica Mann. I thought we could look at how he has managed to create strong statements within this rigid, concise structure of the haiku, even though he uses the English language, which doesn't have the same syllabic structure Japanese does. A man uses what we call seasonal words. Seasonal words are words that bring to mind the image of a particular season. And so he uses winter straight out at the name of the season. When we read uh, the poem by Basho, the example I gave of Basho's writing, he had the word pond, which gives the image or a season of spring or a summer being called to mind. His um, student, uh, Busan, used the word spring, an example similar to what we're seeing here with Aman's winter use. Um, when we look at the types of senses that are being appealed to, we have um, an, an appeal being made definitely to the sense of sight, which is the easy one, but we also have touch in the word winter and also stone. If we look at another example of his writing, the circus tent, all folded up, October mist. Count out the syllables there and you're going to see that it's not 17. Instead, it, it works out to a nice even beat throughout but it falls short of 17. We do have a, a seasonal word in October, and that last line, October mist, and notice the punctuation there, the ellipses, in itself very effective, following the word mist like it's trailing off, just like an image of mist would bring to mind. The nostalgic memory of childhood is sort of folded up in this circus tent, and so, you know, when the summer ends and the tents come down and they're folded up and October rolls in, if we apply that all to the sort of seasons of life metaphor that poets often use, we can sort of see the circus as a representation of our childhood or early adult life where there's, we can have silliness, we can have um, freedom, um, you know, a lot of joy and fun, one would hope, would accompany that part of our life. And then as we get into our later years, the more October part of our life, heading into the winter of our life, all that silliness is sort of packed away and we get more a serious look and, and approach to our, our time here and what we have to do with it. And so the fun is sort of stored away. So we have this heavy meaning associated with this second one. We had a heavy meeting with the third one too, especially when we go back and look at this stone angel who is 
you know, not white and glowing and soft and welcoming, but rather stone, pointing his hand toward an empty sky. We don't see a lot of comfort in this poem. There's a heavy message being given about, you know, the afterlife, at least this is the way I would read it, the afterlife um, paired with that first line, winter burial. And so two heavy meanings in a very brief poem, very concise poem. So it, it's definitely working in terms of the purpose, the design of a haiku, but done in a Western format. Ezra Pound wrote a haiku that has become quite famous. In a station of the metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd petals on a wet black bow. Clearly, it doesn't follow the physical structure of the Japanese haiku, yet it has concise language, capturing a vivid moment in time. It also appeals to more than just the sense of sight. The Haiku Society of America defines haiku's purpose as a poem in which nature is linked to human nature. This is another difference from Japanese haiku, which was concerned with linking to the natural world. But the imagery is still maintained as front and center in both types. The attention to details and senses is still very important. Haikus are the perfect type of writing for right now because they actually support our mental well-being and you know this is something we need to be working on. They are meditative, grounding, they make us look at this present moment and try and work with just what we see right there at that time. They connect us to nature. We should be out more. Uh, you know, we're being told over and over again, take a walk. That's one thing we're for sure allowed to do. Uh, get out on a balcony or look out your window if you can't get out for a walk, but like take in your surroundings and try and connect a bit to nature. They help us capture important moments. It's good to hang on to those things, again, for mental well-being. And they exercise both the left and the right side of our brains. On our left side of the brain, we've got planning, we're detailed oriented, we're ordering our sequences, that's all left brain stuff. And then on the right side, that's the creative writing, that's the emotions that are coming out, the feelings we want to express. That all comes together in this form of writing. Richard Wright, He's a famous writer and poet. He wrote A Native Son. He also wrote 800 haikus, 800 as he lay dying in 1959. And later his, his daughter wrote that this was the perfect thing for him to be doing during this difficult time. She said it developed for him an antidote to illness and it allowed him to, quote, spin poems of light out of the gathering darkness. Many would argue that right now, we are going through a moment of gathering darkness and we need more light. So here's an example of just an average person creating a haiku based on what's going on in our world right now. Moon and stars wonder where have all the people gone alone in hiding. This works on all of the things we were talking about that, that make a, a wonderful haiku. And, and they paired it up with a beautiful picture, perhaps taken when they've been out somewhere. I mean, wouldn't it have been lovely to have been in that spot and capture that view? The poem works. Your face frozen on my screen. These days we all have limited bandwidth. <laughs> okay, so this is a little funnier. Um, you know, normally we don't find funny haikus, they're usually a little deeper, but this one's still deep and it, it follows all the requirements still, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely there are 17 syllables, it's got the three lines, it's got that structure, um, and, and it says something more than what's actually written there. So it works as well. Okay, final slide. Here's the writing challenge I'm going to give you. Go for a walk, or if you can't, look out a window. Find some part of nature, some moment in time that speaks to you. Take a picture of it even, maybe. So when you've got it captured somehow, spend some time then tossing around language to capture what you see, hear, smell, feel, or taste. 
Maybe don't start with trying to think of the bigger picture, just appeal to the senses. Then sift through it all and try and find two images or ideas that you can juxtapose or one image off which you can spark another one. If you can't do that, that's not a big deal. Just work with the 17 and, and the three lines until you get better and better at it. But this would be like an extra challenge, you know, to, to add in that juxtaposition part. Once you've decided what you want to work with, whittle down those words until you get the most concise, the sharpest image you can. But try and keep it always in the present tense. You're trying to freeze a moment. You could be like the Bohemians of the 1950s, the beat poets, and toss away the tradition of 17 syllables and three lines if you want. Or you can stay traditional, follow Basho, the Japanese master, and, and work within the restrictions of the three lines and 17 syllables. Your choice. You might be so pleased with what you come up with that maybe if you're lucky, you're one of those people who have that talent with visual art as well, you could do something crafty with what you constructed. Could be digitally, could be with your hands. Maybe you like to paint and you can add, add the poem into the painting. Another thing you might want to try and do is set up a haiku volley like I did when I, I told you as I started this whole slideshow. I, I started this in October, back in October of 2018 with a friend where I would write one based on a picture and I'd send it to her by text and then she would write one in the next few weeks or a week or so send it back to me and we would go back and forth, back and forth, constructing um, haikus based on images we were trying to freeze during our year of doing this back and forth during the pandemic. Anyway, good luck with it. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoy trying it out and um, make the most of the time you have by constructing something positive of it.